My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Mayadeen Television. Thank well, you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kalimahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but discussing NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which doesn't do what it says on the tin. When I was young, NATO was the US European Alliance for the Defense of Europe, hence the name North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Before I became an older man, the NATO alliance was bombing and attacking European countries and even now occupies a part of Europe in the territory they call Kosovo. In between time, NATO has expanded its purview almost across the entire world. Even Colombia, although the recent change of government in Colombia might alter that fact, is a candidate member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And it is deeply involved in the attempt to taunt the Russians into an all-out European war in the Ukraine. It is heavily involved in the AUKUS alliance between Australia, the United States, and New Zealand. Its tentacles are now everywhere. And so we're asking the question tonight, is NATO the problem rather than the answer to the problem of instability in the world? Many people believed, certainly of my generation, that NATO was set up as a counter to the Warsaw Pact. Only the older viewers will remember that one. This was the military alliance of the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe, but in truth, the Warsaw Pact was set up five years after the establishment of NATO as a counter to the American-European alliance in NATO. Many people in the Western part of Europe still believe that NATO is somehow benign. Although if you go to the streets of Belgrade, you'll find a different story because of course NATO remorselessly bombarded them for almost 90 days, killing tea ladies in the television station in Belgrade and bombing the Chinese embassy. Not sure they'd be bold enough to do that nowadays. I'm joined, as always, by a group of distinguished experts. I'm merely the enthusiastic amateur. And the first of those is older than NATO. Well, almost. He is the veteran British politician, twice mayor of London, the first and finest mayor of London, yeah. and my former parliamentary colleague, Ken Livingstone. Ken, welcome Hi. back to the show. Can I just correct you? I was actually born two years before NATO. Yeah, I knew you would be vain <laughs> enough to point that out, but it was in the ballpark, so oh, I no. thought I'd try and get away with it. But you're looking but splendid. But it dominated our lives, Grant. It up. has. Yeah. So and tell us about it. But that. we were told all the time, we had to be in NATO because Russia, the communists, were going to invade Europe. Of course, that was never the case. Stalin had no plans to invade Western Europe. All he wanted was that barrier of states in the east on his border to provide protection because Russia had been invaded by Napoleon, by Hitler, and they wanted that protection. There was no plan to invade Europe. But we were all told that. I just grew up in that world where, I mean, Literally, kids were sent into the army and, and all this threat that we were going to have to have a war with the Soviet Union. And it was a complete nonsense. It, all it was was about America dominating the world. That was the plan. When The real tragedy is when President Roosevelt died just a month before the defeat of Germany, he'd 
got plans for a proper deal with Stalin to manage a peaceful post-war world. But then Truman, deeply reactionary president, and he was all about rolling back the Soviet Union. That, I mean, a lot of American politicians were frightened that you know, people were very great fans of Stalin because he defeated um, the Nazis. And they thought that it might spread around the world. They feared the spread of communism. And so in, what, 50 years after the war, we spent billions and billions of pounds on military that just wasn't needed or necessary. We could have done so much better for the lives of our people in Britain if we hadn't done that. And on the logic that you have explained, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed mm. and these uh, former allied states in the Warsaw Pact mm. became themselves, mm. for the most part, thoroughly reactionary, <laughs> yes, and yes. many of them United States mm. satellites, there was no further need for NATO. So why did it continue and why has it expanded? Well, I suspect a lot of it is, of course, it generates a lot of money for the arms industry. And the arms industry would have been terrified. If the Cold War comes to the end, we're going to have to shut down, you know. So I think constantly ramping up this fit, the fear that we, you know, we're under threat and all that, we need to spend more on our military, goes on and on and on. And it's been a disaster because you actually look at how, here in Britain, how much underfunding there is for our schools, our NHS now. I mean, the NHS now is getting 18% less than it would have done if the Tory government had carried on with the spending of the previous Labour government. An 18% cut in our NHS. I mean, I've been waiting for a year for just a, 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 a small operation um, to remove a little precancerous growth. That's ridiculous. Jerry Downing, a retired bus driver, another one looking remarkably young for a retired <laughs> man. Uh, he stopped driving <clears throat> buses, but he's still fighting for socialist revolution. <clears throat> Uh, in Britain and indeed elsewhere in the world. Uh, do you have a more nuanced position? Because some of your current in left-wing politics, uh, at least recently, I'm thinking of uh, commentators like Paul Mason and others, former Trotskyites at <laughs> least, who, who have become big on NATO. They even describe it as a, a kind of an example of collectivism. Where do you stand on NATO? Well, let, let, let me voice my outrage at the, be, at the beginning to the, to the uh, Ukraine solidarity campaign uh, led by one Chris Ford and, 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 and now uh, uh, drawing in the, 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 the Mandalites, the anti-capitalist resistance, the, the, uh, the, the uh, Sean Madgamna's uh, um, Sean Madgamna's group, the, the, the Alliance for Workers' Liberty, and, and, and several others, and, and they are explicitly pro-NATO, as, as if, you know, the, the whole Trotskyist heritage of wishing to overthrow capitalism, well, that was all gone. It's just a silly notion, and we should all forget about it. Mm -hmm. And now we should join with the forces that are trying to bring democracy and civilization to the whole world which is what the, the, the Karl Marx called the civilization mongers, uh, who tell us that, 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 that uh, they will bring peace and justice. Well, the NATO has brought peace and justice and civilization to absolutely nowhere at all uh, that it has, <coughs> has spread its tentacles. Uh, uh, and it is, I am, differ somewhat with, with, with Ken and that, um, if we had different, um, capitalist politicians, um, the course of history would be slightly different, this is true, but it would be fundamentally the same. Uh, uh, the drive to, 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 to World War III is inherent in the nature of capitalism itself. It is not uh, 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 something that's thought up uh, by, by, by Donald Trump or Joe Biden or, or anyone. It, it, is, it is the push from the bottom the crisis of capitalism, the falling rate of profit, the inability to, 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 to uh, uh, develop their profit. And, and now the greatest thing that, that, that's, that's, that, that, that's the push towards, the, towards World War III is the fact that actually the sanctions on Russia have backfired spectacularly. Uh, uh, the Russian 
economy is now doing better than it was previously, and the backlash is, is, is in the economies of Europe and, 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 and the United States. It is there where, where inflation is, 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 is increasing. It is there where, where the, uh, the, 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 the whole cost of living crisis is, is developing. Uh, and and the, 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 the very domination of the world by the dollar is now seriously in threat. Mm. That, that is, and, and, and Russia has, has managed to sell its oil unbelievably to countries with, with, with rank reactionary leaderships like, 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 like India and Saudi Arabia, uh, 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 much of Africa, etc. It is, it is exporting its oil to these regions and it's finding its way around the sanctions. So, so these sanctions have, have, have backfired spectacularly uh, on, 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 the, on the system itself. And that is the fundamental drive to war. It, it is within the system itself, not Pat just the actions of, 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 of politicians. Patrick O'Regan, another veteran socialist campaigner, newsman, a former editor of the Newsline uh, newspaper. And yet, and yet, NATO is, uh, enjoys, I suppose, unanimous, parliamentary anyway, support, you would not find any member, perhaps for the first time ever, in the British Parliament today that would call for the abolition of NATO. Not a single Labour member of Parliament would do We that did now. when we were in peace. Indeed, <laughs> uh, that's, we, we've lived so long that we have Trotskyites for NATO yeah. and no anti-NATO Labour MPs. Patrick? Well, this is one, tr one Trotskyite who's not for NATO. I think that uh, NATO is alive, it's well, and it's pushing east. It is the NATO powers that are supplying uh, <coughs> Ukrainian fascists with all the latest equipment. Uh, they intend to fight to the last Ukrainian and to do as much damage to Russia as possible, and if possible to uh, engage in a bit of regime change at the end of it. This is their hope, this is what they wish to do. It's a fantastic situation where people like uh, Johnson and Truss can say uh, more war, we're for the Ukrainian war, more war, bigger as war, better war. This is what, this is what their policy is. Uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a, a fantastic situation because uh, it's the working class of the world that are, pay that are paying for it. And this is where, they, my opinion is, they're going to come unstuck. You now have got gigantic inflation mm. in oil, in food, and so on. You've got people in, in Britain who are eating every other day, and families who say that they eat every three days, and all this sort of stuff. There's been a colossal inflation taking place, and that inflation has taken place because Russian oil has been stopped. Uh, Ukrainian wheat in the main is, uh, is lying rotten on the ground, and the whole world is going hungry. Why? Because the imperialist powers are determined to weaken Russia. And I think it's, it's big changes are taking place. After all, China has put some kind of space vehicle on Mars. This is a country that a uh, hundred years ago was a nation of coolies. If you read uh, Snow's book, he talks about the uh, British uh, compound in uh, in uh, Shanghai and its garden with no dogs or Chinese allowed uh, on it. This was it. They were the absolute pariahs of the planet. Mm. And now, very 100 years later, they have made a colossal leap forward, mm. both militarily, technically, and uh, with through industrially. They were, the, they were the workshop of the world, so to speak. Mm. And they were treated as such. And Russia, provided its share of oil and the fuel. What's happened? Well, what's happened is that uh, 10 years ago, you could be a Russian oligarch and own the, daily, uh, and own the standard. The London uh, Daily Paper, yes. That's <laughs> right. You could uh, own the Chelsea Football Club. Mm. You could have a huge mansion, huge homes. They had an absolutely super relationship with the uh, Russian bureaucracy. Mm. And uh, the Chinese, well, 
I can remember when uh, John MacDonald went into the House of Commons with a little red book, threw it across the Tories and said, you better read this, because if you're going to have a lip and teeth relationship with China, this is what you need. And uh, they did it. The Chinese were actually building a British nuclear power station. Then it changed. Why did it change? Because now Russia and China are industrially and uh, scientifically ahead of imperialism. The British bourgeoisie are trying to claw everything back. They, uh, you know, they've, they've had to uh, put an end to accepting millions of Russian oligarchs for their funds and all the rest of it. And now it's World War to Russia to the end. Why? Because capitalism and imperialism can glimpse that they're being outgunned. You've seen the future, and that's right. Perhaps and works. That's why. Let's get a, let's get a, an independent view. After all, you lefties have <laughs> had your say. Doctor Phil Bevan uh, from Birmingham in England, an independent scholar, writer, and researcher. Let's hear what he thinks. Thank you, George. Is it NATO that's creating the problems around the world? <laughs> Thank you, George. Um, short answer would be uh, yes. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, and there's different factors at play. Um, but the the main issue is is NATO expansion at the moment, um, which it, basically NATO, what NATO is doing um, is is breaking a lot of agreements that it has previously had with other countries. Um, uh, and that's what's causing a lot of tension and and, and people, it's, it's got other countries, particularly say Russia, uh, China, very nervous because they've got this nuclear alliance on their doorstep. And because of they've broken their word so many times, I mean, NATO has, um, they can't trust what they're going to do next. And that is why you've had all of this uh, tension um, over Ukraine and then followed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's because they don't trust NATO um, not to not to use the situation in Ukraine, NATO's expansion in Ukraine to weaken and destabilize Russia. And um, one of the reasons they don't trust NATO uh, not to try and uh, use Ukraine to destabilize Russia is because the United States uh, met people, uh, politicians and organizations in the United States have explicitly said that that's what they want to do. They want they want regime change in Russia. Um, so. In a sense, um, particularly in Ukraine, what, what's happening is, is kind of an aggressive defensive policy from Russia. And we've seen this from Russia in history before. For example, um, the Soviet Union during the Second World War had expanded into Eastern Europe to, have a, to create a series of buffer states uh, that would help to uh, protect Russia from any um, future aggression from the West. Um, and of course, even before that, you had the, the uh, Russian Civil War, which, um, which was basically uh, Winston Churchill organized the, uh, the White Armies and, and foreign, to be backed by foreign troops, which invaded Russia from the West. So, so, so the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine has to be seen in, in context of the, uh, the origins of previous Western invasions of Russia. In your assessment as a, as a scholar, has NATO been a pact for peace or a pact for war in recent years? Um, speaking, I mean, going right back to its origins, um, NATO, in my view, it's my personal view, my view is that NATO has never been a, um, a pact for peace um, because it, it comes out of, if you look at, again, if you go back to the, uh, the end of the Second World War, um, the beginning of the Cold War, the, uh, you had the dropping of the uh, atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we now know through historical um, documents that that was a war crime. It was completely unnecessary for that to happen. Uh, the Japanese were going to surrender anyway. And the only, well, not the only reason, but the main reason they did it uh, was, was one, to test these weapons. And then the other, the other main reason was to frighten off the Russians. Um, we also know, thanks to... Uh, leaked documents, well, not leaked documents, but historical documents that have now been released and are now available, that Winston Churchill had a plan um, once the Nazis were defeated to actually extend the war into invading the Soviet Union. And so it was also Winston Churchill, who, whose friend Avril Harriman was a key Truman advisor and architect of the Marshall Plan. 
um, who proposed this idea of, um, of the Iron Curtain in his Fulton Address speech. And it was Churchill who'd really defined the parameters of the Cold War. And of course, I, I think I mentioned earlier that Churchill was behind the, uh, a, a lot of the, the Western backing of the White Armies in, in the um, Civil War. So NATO was always about um, containing Russia, weakening Russia right from the off. And actually, you know, it, it's fairly common knowledge that the, the rationale behind NATO was to um, keep the Germans down, the Americans in and the Russians out. And that's, that is what it's for. 30 countries are in NATO now, 21 are uh, on the candidates list. How far uh, is NATO going to expand? <laughs> Thanks, Josh, it's a very difficult question because I, I, um, I, I, I mean, I think it, I can't predict the future and I think it depends on how sensible people are. Uh, at the moment, you, you know, you've got Sweden and Finland um, joining, uh, which isn't great because the NATO expansion now, it's gone beyond, far beyond even its original um, member states. And it was, uh, it was, as I've said before, I believe it was aggressive then. And to expand it, it is actually to, um, to further destabilize the international situation. So we've got to remember that primarily it's the nuclear alliance. And the more countries you have involved in NATO, the more likely it is that there is going to be a nuclear war, uh, which is the end of life on Earth. So, um, unfortunately, I don't think policymakers in the United States or here in Britain are particularly sensible or particularly rational people at the moment. Um, so they are pushing for NATO expansion and countries are, are, are joining in. So I fear it will expand. My hope is people will start to think twice because actually what all these what NATO expansion and the consequences of that in terms of sanctions and, and the shrinking Western um, access to resources um, means that the West is weakening now uh, and NATO no longer looks well to rational people NATO would no longer look like um, a good prospect for the future so I, I sincerely hope that sanity and common sense prevails and um, and actually people start to think again about expanding NATO. The UK has always been involved in the arms race since the very creation of NATO. Some say that as much as 80% of our research and development spend is on militarily related uh, products and developments. So if, uh, if NATO were to stop expanding if it were to come into greater question what would be the impact on the economy of that um i think actually massively um in the 1980s for instance um where when when britain uh when thatcherism when britain was trans transitioning it changing its economy um the one kind of manufacturing that you know didn't get obliterated was the arms industry um, so the focus on NATO and, and um, just recently the government announced another 16 billion spending on, on, on the weapons industry and the more money that gets spent on arms manufacturing, uh, the more power you give the, um, the big arms producers like BAE systems and the more power they have is the more leverage they have over um, politics because if, if they're the ones uh, providing jobs. Uh, then they've got a, a huge kind of lobbying interest in, in, in politics and, um, and also public perception to an extent, because if people lose their jobs by closing the military um, manufacturing uh, industry, then, then, then obviously that, that's going to have a negative impact on politics. But also um, at, a, at a bit more deeper level, um, it's important to, if you're really trying to understand the impact of NATO on the economy um, of this country and elsewhere, Again, you need to look at the history of it, and um, it's essentially it's as a successor to the British Empire. Because um, at the end of the Second World War, obviously, um, it was a, NATO was a British invention, and you know one of the one of the big uh, purposes of it was to keep Britain at the top table. Well, keeping Britain at the top table didn't work out <laughs> all that well. There's much more coming up after the break. Stay tuned.
I'm George Galloway. This is Kale Mahora on Al Maidin Television discussing NATO, which is coming to you, I promise you, wherever you are, because NATO is vaultingly expansionist. It is turning up in parts of the world which were never even dreamt of as potential theatres of NATO military action, even just a decade or two ago. But Ken Livingston, that uh, wonderful phrase that NATO's purpose is to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down, mm. uh, the Americans have shown no signs of wanting to leave. You did get a brief America first, mm. Donald Trump uh, threatening saber rattling against NATO, but the Biden administration could not be more different from that. They are here to stay. Uh, and far from keeping the Germans down, they are being actively encouraged mm. to rearm, yeah. to build up their armed forces. And as for keeping the Russians out, well, they're not keeping them out of Ukraine <laughs> very successfully. So but then, in that sense, is NATO failing? Well, I mean, what I find interesting about the bulk of the British media, when they're talking about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I, they don't talk about the fact that uh, in Crimea, 90% of the people were Russian. And I, that's why, uh, that's what we find out. Now, I don't support Putin, but I don't support what America's been doing either, all my life. I mean, you think about the war in Vietnam, I mean, three million Vietnamese killed by American bombing. All the Vietnamese wanted was their own independence, create their own state, break off from the colonialism. And that's the, the history. We grew up in a world where Britain and France dominated so much of the world through our colonies. We treated them appallingly. Unfortunately, we had to give up and withdraw, and they got their own control. But literally, if I think back, all those wars in our childhood where the people in a, one of our colonies were fighting for their own independence, and we didn't actually just step back and say, of course, you, you, you create your own country. It's not our job in, you know, for Britain to be actually controlling big chunks of uh, Africa or Asia. It was nonsense. And it, I mean, it is a disaster for the, the legacy of that. We should have had, I mean, as I said at the beginning, if Ru President Roosevelt hadn't died, there could have been a really good cooperative deal between America and Russia. But President Truman didn't go through that. And millions are dead because of that. And the impact on our economy has been disastrous. Think of all the money we could have spent making a better life for our people if we hadn't been spending so much on our military. And billions on building nuclear weapons, which you're never going to use because if you start that, we're all going to die all over the planet. Let's uh, hear from Ireland this time, from Stephen Bell, uh, who is a senior member of the Stop the War Coalition. Stephen. Yeah. In your view, Stephen, is it NATO that is the main cause of the problems around the world at the moment? Uh, well, NATO is the organization dominated by US imperialism to promote the interests of US imperialism and its allies. And the suggestion that it's a defensive organization is belied by NATO's own history, particularly its recent history. I mean, look at the position in Afghanistan after 20 years of NATO intervention, a catastrophe for the people of Afghanistan. Um, similarly, uh, the, the position in Libya, where NATO's intervention has resulted in destruction of what was formerly um, the uh, 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 nation on the African continent, with the best living standards, um, according to Human Development Index. Um, and now that's been destroyed. Uh, you have two, two governments, two parliaments, endless militias and open slave markets and so on. And this is what NATO has done. It uh, attacks independent uh, uh, countries which refuse to accept the overall hegemony of uh, imperialism and um, certainly this is uh, what NATO is continuing uh, to do. Um, Surely in, in 1991, with the breakup of the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact alliance going into reverse, really, that would have been a moment for the shrinking of NATO, if not its abolition. Instead, it became the moment for its expansion. The question is why? Well, 
the expansion of uh, NATO was done despite all the assurances given to Gorbachev, Yeltsin and subsequent uh, leaders, the refusal um, to accept Russia's legitimate security uh, uh, interests and was best demonstrated by absolute failure to negotiate towards the end of last year um, with Russia, instead insisting the, op the option of Ukraine entering um, uh, NATO must remain open. Um, and we recall 1962, the United States would not tolerate um, nuclear weapons on the island of Cuba um, and threatened to take the world to nuclear war because, because of that. Yet somehow Russia is supposed to accept the possibility and probably inevitability of nuclear weapons being uh, stationed within 10 minutes flying time of Moscow um, and the opportunity of the US, which it seeks as part of its uh, 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 military dominance to destroy Russian nuclear weapons before um, it has the chance to retaliate so that the United States has an effectively first strike capacity. And that's what's so dangerous about the situation that the US is pursuing a, a line which envisages the possibility of uh, nuclear war and the possibility of it surviving. What's the reason for the eastward expansion, one that was ruled out, by the way, uh, in uh, promises made to Gorbachev at the end of the Soviet Union, but they're not just expanding in Eastern Europe now and causing a major war uh, on European territory in the Ukraine, yeah. but they are expanding towards Eastern Asia. Why? Okay. Why now? At the heart of this is the decline of the US economically. I mean, not, it's not an absolute decline. It's still, uh, it still has a very powerful economy, but relatively, it is declined in the world. According to the IMF, the um, China surpassed um, the US in the size of its economy in 2016. Um, by 2021, China represents 19%, this is IMF figures, 19% of the world economy, the US 16%. And by 2027, the IMF estimates that the US econ uh, the Chinese economy will be 30% larger um, than the US. So the US has lost the peaceful economic competition with China, but where the US and developing countries, you know, throughout Asia and Latin America and so on are growing faster than the than the United States. So Unable to now outcompete its rivals, the one area where the US has an absolute dominance is militarily. Its military budget is larger than the spending of the next 11 powers combined. Right? So it's huge military uh, power. And it's using that to shake up what it can't shake up and organize economically. It's attempting to do militarily. How has NATO's expansion affected uh, other countries? Uh, even, even Africa uh, is now a playground for NATO. How has it affected people there? Well, you see the attempts to strengthen military alliances in what it calls in the Indo-Pacific, but everybody else calls the Asian Pacific, um, and in the... Uh, North Africa, West Asia, attempts to utilize, draw in um, Arab countries into a system of alliances with Israel via the Abraham Accords and so on and so on. So you have a, a sense of collective security. The GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council, was an attempt to do that historically, but absolutely failed. So this, they think, is a better attempt, and Biden is continuing Trump's policy. Um, on this. Uh, they want Saudi Arabia in uh, and so on. But they are also talking in terms of, and this the most recent NATO summit at Madrid talks in terms of um, Africa as NATO's southern neighbourhood. 
Now, this is just a further expression of what the US used in the 19th century, the Monroe Doctrine, when it regarded Latin and Central America as its southern neighborhood, and it had the right to control. And so you have this potential threat that wherever the developing world is making progress and um, the African continent has seen a growth of economic relations with both China and Russia in recent years, China especially, the United States believes they that it has the right, whether via NATO or on its own, to change that, to overturn that, regardless of the desires of the African people. And again, this is, um, it's an expression of its economic weakness. It can't simply make an economic offer anymore. It has to use the threat. Jerry, uh, Bob Dylan's line, you can't win with a losing hand. The more you listen, uh, NATO's got a losing hand economically, most importantly, but it's also not true what Stephen said, that they are militarily dominant. You can say that they won the war in breaking up Yugoslavia, but ever since then, it's been a losing hand. It's just a year ago that men on bicycles chased them out of Afghanistan. They've spent hundreds of billions uh, in Ukraine and failed. So if you're failing economically and you're failing militarily, what's left? Well, I, I, I think there's a, a great deal of exaggeration here about the decline of, of, of US imperialism. Uh, uh, I, I've read an article recently that says, well, actually, US imperialism uh, has not declined. Well, what it has done, it has uh, globalized. So the, the, uh, uh, the Chinese economy uh, right, appears to be uh, bigger than the, the, the uh, US economy, but who actually owns the Chinese economy? What about uh, what happened to poor Donald Trump when he slapped those sanctions on, on Chinese imports mm. and he had a huge backlash? <laughs> Loads of those Chinese imports were actually uh, uh, exported by American companies based in China. Mm. So, so a whole section of the, of, the, of the Chinese economy is actually owned by, 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 by the United States. Uh, uh, and also, uh, what, what, what's happening is, is that the, the bringing the, 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 the Germans and the French to heel, they, they have succeeded in doing that, that they stopped the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, but Germany and France do not like that. They are not at all pleased to be humiliated in that, in that. And the big fear that they had, of course, was that Germany and France would bring the EU into alliance with Russia and China uh, and outdo the... the, the uh, and that's, that, that's something that may yet happen. Uh, the reason I'm making these points is that it, it, it does seem to me that, look, any kind of political manoeuvre you make uh, has to be based on, on, on the real uh, economic strengths. Uh, and in my view, you, you, you have to have a revolutionary perspective globally or else you won't win anything. Patrick, a level of uh, predestination, predetermination, uh, worthy of, of Calvinism. Is World War III absolutely inescapable then? Of course it is, isn't it? It's not, it's not inescapable. Is How it, are we going to escape it then? I mean, right. by Jerry's analysis. Well, yeah, uh, so no, there are some who believe that all is lost kind of thing. But uh, human beings have been in this position before when different social systems have looked to be the, like ended of the world, were actually replaced by higher orders. If you look at, uh, at, uh, at Britain today, for example, You've got a decrepit ruling class uh, that can only continue by uh, war in the Ukraine and uh, is desperate to hang on anyhow or somehow and is having grave problems with the working class. I think, uh, I think Britain is heading for an explosion because millions and millions of people are having their wages cut they're having uh, their lives changed, their children are suffering, 
and it's millions of people. And uh, Boris Johnson and Truss and all the others uh, say, um, lift the sanctions on, uh, on Russia and so on, so the world can back, get back to order. No, we must fight on. So their uh, struggle to maintain the capitalist order and to take an opportunity of the crisis in the Ukraine to drive Russia back, which involves raising huge price increases, cut, wage cuts and all the rest of it, is creating revolutionary situations in the European countries, in Britain, and also in the United States. Jerry, I want, we're going to do one last round. Right. Uh, I, I want your view on how all this impacts NATO. It's my case here, let me be the devil's advocate, that NATO is a military failure uh, because it's not the size of the dog in the fight that counts, it's the size of the fight in the dog. The Afghans defeated vastly superior forces, vastly superior, and they, they drove them out of town like thieves in the, in the night. The vast expenditure by NATO countries on the Ukraine war has turned into, uh, as has been said by all of us, a backlash uh, and a, an act of self-harm, uh, of hideous proportions, where we are suffering and the Russian economy is doing extremely well, thank you. So it's an economic and a military failure. Where then is the political response to that? I mean, in Germany, perhaps we can look forward to a change in government and a change in policy in Germany. They are on the front line after all. But in countries like Britain, there seems to be almost absolute quiescence. If you went out now and said, vote for me, I want out of NATO, people would laugh at you. I don't know if that's true. Uh, um, I, I, I've seen a statistic that says that up to 38% of Tory supporters support these strikes. This, this time around, this strike uh, uh, is, 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 is very popular. I, I, I think that the, the, the situation is hopeful uh, 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 and encouraging in, 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 in the strike wave that's not just here, it's also in the United States, it's also in a, in a, in a, in a number of other places that it's coming. And, and the, the last point I, I, I'd make is that you have to differentiate as well. See, I, I, I believe in order to make a revolution, you have to have a revolutionary party. I don't think the Labour Party will ever be a, a revolutionary party and I don't think it will ever overthrow capitalism. But I do think that, that as long as the, the, the unions are, 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 are within it, that it, it is an arena for struggle and it will continue to be a, 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 an arena for struggle until there is a major break and, and until there is, you, you, you unite maybe the, I don't know, the G and B is a bit hopeless, but... but uh, <laughs> I fear all these alphabet soups will be lost on our global uh, all right. audience. Okay. Patrick, uh, I mean, it seems to me, and I repeat myself to some extent, that uh, if not a busted flush, I take uh, Jerry's point, imperialism isn't a busted flush, America is not a busted flush, it's not a paper tiger, it wasn't when Mao said it in the 60s, it isn't even now, but it is an old tiger. Its teeth are falling out, it's lame. There are new tigers uh, in the jungle. They cannot impose their military will anywhere and their economic performance is beginning to visibly fail. That must make you optimistic, no? I am optimistic. <laughs> when you look at uh, what's required as the World Party of Socialist Revolution to lead it and uh, there's now in Britain a situation where goodness knows what it's going to be like in six months time. You'll get people with gigantic debts, you'll have no pay movements, all kinds of things, you know. So we're going to have something that, uh, for the middle classes, will look like, make the poll tax movement look like uh, some tiny little happening. There's a huge mass movement developing because the ruling class are determined to have at Russia come what may as a matter of life and death, whatever it does to inflation, whatever it does to prices. That's why working people are beginning to feel it. They're already attacking Mick Lynch, the, uh, the RMT leader, 
because he won't condemn Russia in the Ukraine. They're saying this is not the kind of person that you want leading a, leading a trade union. There's a different people... Well, Ken Livingston was ready to condemn him if Mick Lynch uh, <laughs> wasn't. Uh, so let's give Ken the last word. Um, Ken, the, uh, the economic situation is dire, getting more. People will be paying thousands of pounds for their gas bills. Yeah. Petrol is and diesel unaffordable to many people who depend on cars. The and they're not going to let you stand up and truck, do it. They're uh, going to be doing things about the it. The truck transport uh, industry is suffering through increased costs. That's passed on in food prices. Shortages in the shops. Shortages of fertilizer and all that. On the face of it, in the NATO countries, They've made a gigantic mistake. Uh, to, to quote again Chairman Mao, they have struggled mightily to lift a huge stone only to drop it on their own feet. Do you expect we're going to live to see a big change? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm very pessimistic about the future because no government's doing enough to tackle climate change. But let's just stick to the economy rather than slip off into that. I think there is a real risk that we are seeing... Well, we are seeing inequality has doubled in Britain in the last 40 years. You and I grew up in that post-war world where inequality was halved. Every year, everything got better. I mean, poor people got better year by year. Councils were building hundreds of thousands of council homes and so on. Now we're seeing people left behind. I mean, the suicide rate is horrendous because so many people just have got no chance of optimism for our future. So I want to see the Labour Party become a genuinely more radical and challenging uh, the abuse of uh, power that we got in Britain with all the wealth going to a small elite. We need to look at that. I and mean, it wasn't just the Labour government after the war. It was then the, the Tory government under Macmillan. But it was the Labour government that better. formed NATO. It, it did, and it was a great mistake because they, they built into all that nonsense that, that they, you know, Stalin was planning to invade the West and all that nonsense. But don't get I mean, America, at the end of the Second World War, controlled half the global economy. It set that agenda. And although that postal Labour government did so much to make our lives better with the NHS and the welfare state, I do think the biggest mistake they made was just going along with America's viciously anti-Soviet um, policy. So we now are in the situation where NATO is engaged or in pre-engagement mode virtually all over the world in the... Indo-Pacific, as they call it, Asia-Pacific, as it used to be called. They hope to uh, lever India away from China and away from Russia, and that's why they call it the Indo-Pacific. In uh, recalcitrant parts of Europe, uh, like in the occupation of uh, Kosovo, but there are sharks in the water, and I don't refer to the nuclear submarines of the AUKUS. The conflict with Turkey is something that we were not able to develop the argument today into, is uh, a potential shark in the water. Turkey and Greece may well go to war, two NATO powers at war with each other. There are contradictions. As Jerry said, uh, France and Germany are not at all pleased to be being led by the nose by the Anglo-Saxon alliance of Britain and the United States. There are tensions inside NATO. Failure in Ukraine will surely accentuate them. The economic crisis amongst NATO countries and their own people's uprising in response may very well achieve what we peacemongers were never able to achieve. Maybe NATO will have to abolish itself at the rate things are going. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahora on Al Maidin Television. Thank you for watching.